And now that uh, Sretsko has spoken so eloquently about Greece, I can be free to speak of something else, which is great, because one, one of the most problematic repercussions of this situation is that we have all turned into national subjects, and uh, we, we feel compelled somehow to, to speak in the name of, of one's country, which is very, I think, very restrictive and very problematic. Uh, this is a moment of impasse, uh, this is a moment of devastating defeat. Um, most of us in the left, uh, uh, not only in Greece, but in Europe in general, uh, we mourn uh, this, this uh, moment of defeat, but we, also, we have also started reflecting uh, what is to be done now, what we can do not uh, against this uh, defeat, which is already already there, what we can do uh, rather uh, despite the morning, despite the defeat, and how can we handle uh, what I would call the dialectics of defeat? Uh, how can we open the temporality of defeat and see how we can handle it against its own grain? Uh, before talking, before, before entering into my couple of points that I'd like to make about Syria and the current situation of defeat, um, I'd like to honor the title of this uh, symposium, which, is, which I, I admit I, I was really intrig intrigued by, by, it, by the title of the conference. Uh, this is a wonderfully negative formulation, this is not Greece, um, that indicates uh, that a definition can only be attained through negation, and thus perhaps is the only possible definition, the, the only defini definition worthy of its name. And also, uh, this is a formulation that uh, invites very interesting questions, such as which Greece are we talking about? What is Greece and what is not Greece? In the name of which Greece is the phrase, this is not Greece, uttered. And finally, against what kinds of regimes of epistemic violence do such representations and misrepresentations make sense or do not make sense? My aim, however, is not to correct. I'm not here to correct you know, misconceptions of Greece. And this is so for two reasons. First, because every representation is bound to be a misrepresentation. That is, every representation is vulnera vulnerable to the workings of epistemic violence, to use uh, Gayatri Spivak's famous phrase, uh, which has to do with the regulatory power of discourse and the epistemic foundations of violence. What is at stake here is not just the lack of recognition of the other, but the norms that set out in advance the standards of recognizability by which truth, uh, but also subjects themselves, are affected into being. And second, second reason for which I'm not going to, I'm not in the business of cor correcting misconceptions here, is that uh, because correcting misconceptions and mis misrepresentations is premised upon a certain identification with the misrepresented object. If one enters this apparatus of setting the, the record straight in the form of this is not Greece, one is bound to slip into the mode of what Greece really is in all its self-affirmative and even nationalist implications. One is bound to enter a mode of affirming ontological principles that supposedly make the definition proper. So I'm not interested in uh, setting the record straight. Maybe I'm more interested in second the record queer, but we'll talk about this later. So I'm interested here in what makes this definition, any definition, uh, lacking and troubling what makes it improper, inappropriate, and not appropriable. So I would like to maintain the apophatic, the, the, not, the negative element, but paraphrase a little bit the title of today's event from this is not Greece to this is not about Greece. This is not about Greece. 
or this is not only about Greece, if you wish. To engage in such a critical performative inquiry is to theorize representation as a technology of power in today's Europe. And uh, talking about that, I'm taking uh, the line from uh, Sretzko's uh, lecture before, who talked about or implied very eloquently about the politics of representation. So the formulation, this is not Greece, resonates in an interestingly uncanny way. Oh, it's there. Okay. Uh, with the famous, this is not a pipe. Uh, of course, we may, we may be all remember that in about 1929, I think it was, the uh, Belgian artist René Magritte created this uh, iconic uh, piece of art, which was called the Treachery of Images. Um, it was considered to be the iconic masterpiece of surrealism. Uh, the most interesting part here is that underneath this perfectly realistic illustration of a pipe, Magritte painted the strict the, the script, this is not a pipe. Um, indeed, the painting is not a pipe, of course, but rather an image of a pipe. Uh, and in 1968, Michel Foucault wrote a small book uh, with the same title, This is not a pipe, where he interestingly argued that Magritte's drawing strips us of the certainty that the pipe is a pipe, as it, quote, inaugurates a play of transferences that run, proliferate, propagate, and correspond within the layout of the painting, aff affirming and representing nothing. And it, it, it's interesting that in, in chapter six, Foucault, uh, uh, and this chapter bears the title, Non-Affirmative Painting. Uh, and Foucault talks about the way in which uh, the painter, Magritte, skirts the base of what he calls affirmative discourse on which resemblance calmly reposes. So how to respond to this prompter today, this is not Greece, without calmly reposing on the base of affirmative discourse, without slipping into a discourse of what Greece really is. Um, in, this res in this respect, what is very important to my mind uh, about the formulation, this is not Greece, is that it casts doubt not only on an established matrix of appearances, but also on the authority of representation, and of course, representation as authority. So I'm going to try a little bit to talk about this relation between representation and uh, political representation. Uh, let me remind you in, in advance that representation is not merely about the relation between a present reality already existing and its sub subsequent portrayal or depiction or representation. By the same token, political representation does not merely represent a pre-existing entity, but rather generates political subjects through interpolation and exclusion. In other words, it generates a relationship to the present, and that's exactly where we are today. In other words, political representation is about establishing, demarcating, and regulating a realm of repre representability. And this is, of course, uh, 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 also the quintessential question of politics, a question related to the processes by which certain discourses, desires, political affects, and subjects are made to appear within um, and according to a given regime of appearance uh, and representability. Um, and I would like to emphasize this because I think that it's important, especially today, to remember that neoliberal governmentality is not only a mode of financial restructuring but also a certain political, post-political uh, rationality uh, which works through subjectivation, which works through producing certain uh, uh, genres or even types of uh, subjects, subjects of, of debt, uh, subjects of precarity, uh, subjects of uh, national crisis, but also subjects of relationality. Uh, oops. So it is precisely the idea of an 
absent presence that accounts for the dialectical contradiction underlying representation. You see what is the, the paradox here? Political representation seeks to offer visibility to subjects. And at the same time, it sets the normative standards by which subjects are formed as potentially visible, presentable, and representable. This is clearly connected to the subject as not present to itself, but as constituted through processes of becoming, unbecoming, being divided from itself, being outside of itself, coming together with others. The question of political subjectivation, the question of becoming subject in political terms, and in its link to subjugation demands a conceptual clarification here. And this goes back to Michel Foucault, of course, who has taught us how to understand subjugation in terms of subjectification and vice versa. In other words, uh, we are bound to understand subjugation as uh, the subjection of uh, individuals to power uh, in terms of subjectivation, which indicates the process uh, of the creation, the, the creation of subjects through uh, the, the workings of power. Now, we're thus confronted with the title that was given to my talk today, uh, The Power of the, of the Dispossessed, uh, which has to do with the question of how people uh, assume political subjectivity. And this is, to me, a very important question, especially today, because we are in this uh, even affective, I would say, situation of powerlessness, of uh, lack of hope, uh, lack of the sense of hope even. So uh, this is my question, how people assume political subjectivity, how people assume uh, power in times of powerlessness. Uh, how they do so by normative processes and despite these normative processes. And this is a question that bespeaks what has been currently registered as a need for a return to the political subject. A lot of talk uh, in uh, left theory today has to do with this question, how to define uh, the political subject, political subjectivity. What um, qualifies as political subjectivity? And I think this is, this is really very well connected to the question of how to think critically in times of crisis. So I would like to argue here that uh, part of our project here of thinking critically in times of crisis is exactly to uh, pose and again and again the question of political subjectivity and the question of the political. Despite the fact that the whole neoliberal orthodoxy is trying to make us all into uh, economical subjects, to reduce all um, uh, political discourse into a kind of uh, economic management discourse. What is at stake here, thus, is whether it is possible to come up with an account of uh, the people, as I said before, or uh, the, the, an account of democracy, uh, I would put it in quotation marks right now, uh, open to new redistributions of appearance and subjectivation on the political se uh, scene. So uh, what I'm doing here is taking the title of the conference as a thought experiment in order to attend to the performative presence of the agonistic in the political. So how can we think of the performative presence uh, of the agonistic element in the political in times where uh, it seems that uh, we're dealing with a domination of a kind of post-political, post-democratic orthodoxy in Europe? And my point of departure uh, in talking about that is what I perceive as a need uh, for the whole European left, whatever this means, to develop an understanding of democracy as the other of neoliberal autarky. So how, uh, what, da what, does, uh, what does this take to, to think, to understand of democracy as the other of neoliberal governmentality today? Uh, in these times of uh, enduring crisis as an authoritarian device of governmentality, Emerging critical uh, gestures 
uh, raise again and again the question of the authority of representation in its intimate relation to the question of the police uh, as a multivalent state of belonging and unbelonging, uh, as a question, of, in other words, of who belongs to uh, the police and who does not belong, on what condition and at what cost, which kinds of desires, bodies, relations are publicly registered as presentable and representable. And I think that our present moment of dissolution and uh, powerlessness and uh, loss of hope, maybe, is marked by not only crisis, not only this defeat, some people call it uh, cap capitulation, but also by its becoming ordinary. That's exactly, exactly what we're dealing with right now. That the crisis, that is the neoliberal orthodoxy, is, is in its uh, process of becoming ordinary, uh, including becoming ordinary through uh, a series of uh, ethnic stereotypes, even racializing stereotypes that seem to prevail in mainstream media representations. Uh, mass media uh, campaigns and certain political commentators continue to abuse the rhetoric of cultural differences by depicting, uh, I don't know, the, no, the Greek people as lazy, uh, spoiled, uh, unruly, benefit suckers, the welfare queens of the neoliberal Europe, uh, who refuse to honor their debt, and so on and so forth. And all this, of course, at the cost of the hardworking peoples of Europe. Uh, of course, stereotyping works to the opposite direction too, right? Um, uh, we certainly uh, are exposed to uh, stereotypes which attribute neoliberal aggression and austerity politics to uh, the Protestant ethics of Germans. Uh, and of course, uh, I think the, the, the stereotype of masculinity is also a very strong one, especially if we think this discourse about how uh, the soft Tsipras capitulated, whereas the real man, Varoufakis, resisted. Uh, the, the possibility of uh, agreement and so, so, so on and so forth. So such uh, everyday states of epistemic violence is one of the most, uh, to me at least, one of the most problematic, one of the most scary and daunting repercussions of the present uh, European crisis and its logics, its logistics. Now, I think that an antidote to these totalizing representations that embody the truth regime of uh, neoliberal orthodoxy today would require a project of deconstructing the conditions of possibility for the making present of such representations. And this problem suggests in many ways uh, the question of critical epistemologies <coughs> of crisis. I think what is needed today is a critical methodology that would persistently denationalize and repoliticize the discursive regime of crisis, the discursive regime of neoliberal governmentality. So, denationalize and repoliticize this uh, regime. Uh, I would say that uh, an open laboratory for political imagination and critical utopianism is nothing short of necessary today in order to engage in a collective rethinking of uh, neoliberalism in its uh, implications of livability within and against the exigencies of global capital. Now, uh, let me formulate my uh, question here, which I think is uh, the most demanding political question today, but also the most necessary question to be posed and probably answered. Is there any way to embody the present as a vantage point for turning contingency into an occasion of possibility under conditions of impossibility? And these questions make sense in a certain context, of course, which is not only a Greek context. It's a European context. It's a, it's a context which goes far beyond the national boundaries of Greece and even Europe, I would say. Uh, and, of course, the context is very important here if we think that um, uh, the question assumes its urgency 
in context of facing a lifetime of debt, uh, unemployment, home foreclosure, <laughs> eviction, poverty, and dissolution of public health and education. At the same time, however, it concerns the possibility of envisioning and enacting ongoing political alliances of shared vulnerability, alternative sensibility, responsiveness, and also dissent, also, in other words, agonistic stance. And this, I think, uh, should be posed in transnational, transnational rather than national terms. Now, recent events in Greece uh, show in the most clear and loud way the way in which one of the normative impulses of European and European Union orthodoxy is to forestall the element of dissent, the element of disagreement, and to establish the authoritarian doctrine that neoliberal austerity is the only possible game in town. Uh, now, the Syriza-led coalition government introduced this kind of uh, unsettling and disturbing uh, disagreement and dissent. Uh, and this is, I think, the main point here uh, which might help us to think about the developments of the recent developments uh, which culminated in the agreement of uh, the uh, 13th of July. For five years, as we may know very well, the peoples of Greece and other uh, countries of the European South have been experiencing the implications of a compulsory economization of the political terrain. And this included, of course, not only austerity as such, but also uh, severe inequalities, dispossession of public space, dismissal of social rights, uh, devaluation of the constituent terms of democracy. Now, enforcing their bailout agreement on July 13, the creditors succeeded in continuing the bailout cycle. They provided a new loan and required the dispossession of public resources and indebted citizens properties in order to respond to Greece's incapacity to pay back its debt. Since the long night of July 12, 13, uh, when massive pressure was exerted over the Greek government, uh, the Greek Prime Minister, to compel Greece out of the Eurozone or agree on a punitive austerity package, the European Union is a different place. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an institutional place marked by, first, the surrender of liberal democracy to the forces of neoliberal uh, authoritarianism, but also one pulsating with dissent and protests against the anti-democratic excesses and um, uh, depredations of those forces. Now, I think that there are two moves that we are uh, bound to, to take at this point. First, to acknowledge the defeat, uh, to, to avow the defeat and to acknowledge the sheer uh, uh, pain and injury that this defeat uh, brings with it uh, to many people in the movements, in the left, uh, not only in Greece, as I said before. Second move that we're supposed to take uh, and to make in, in my mind is to reflect and mobilize, politically mobilize the dialectics of uh, this defeat. What does, what does this mean? That we have to think that the defeat is not a single moment. It's not the end of history. So how can we historicize the defeat in a way in which we can mobilize politically the potentiality of defeat? In other words, how to do things with the defeat? Some of you may remember the, the title of the book of James Austin, uh, How to do things with words. So how to do things with the, this defeat now? Because, and I'm, I'm saying that because I think that Syriza has defeated, has uh, succeeded, even though, even through this uh, defeat, in provoking a, a rupture within the European structure, I think that it has managed to debunk the precedence of economy over politics, and it has managed to inspire peoples of Europe to imagine what has been unimaginable so far. 
that is another Europe, another democratic configuration of politics in Europe. To a certain extent, that was an impossibility. But it's very interesting always to remember what things, what kinds of things can become possible through handling a politics of impossibility. Uh, so Syriza succeeded in politicizing the debt question, uh, delegitimizing austerity policies, but also putting in question the normativity of the EU as a post-democratic neoliberal project. Would Syriza have achieved that if it had won? I don't know, and I think that uh, no definite answer can be formulated here. What seems entirely clear, however, is that Syriza, in, in traversing and possibly partially displacing the existing balance of forces in Europe, it was brutally punished and it was politically enervated by a politically uh, much, much stronger political opponent. But perhaps the greatest victory that emerged from, from the recent defeat of the Greek left government is that it revealed in the most clear way the Europe that we can no longer desire. It propelled a resolute, this is not Europe. Sorry, it seems that. Um, of course, we're back again in the trap of, of representation. Right? The utterance, this is not Europe, implies that there might be another Europe possible other than the colonial Europe, the imperial Europe, the capitalist Europe, uh, other than the neoliberal genealogies that have made Europe intelligible, other than fortress Europe. Is this kind of Europe possible? Uh, I think this is not the question. The question is, uh, to what extent can this be made possible? In other words, the wager, the challenge for us on the left, I think, today is to defend what has not been yet acquired. So the question for me is how to politically translate this is not Europe into a performativity of transnational critical agency. That is, into collective projects of critical engagement based on international solidarity among the European left and the social movements. Instead of non-dialectical accusations over the capitulation of the Syriza-led coalition government, I think that we need collective intellect, resilience and action that address the overwhelmingly, sorry, the overwhelming complexity of fighting for democracy and social justice under conditions of creditor coercion and neoliberal hegemony. And this takes me to um, another point that I would like to make, and this is a little, well, uh, theoretical. Uh, and uh, this will take me to Jacques Derrida, who writes that democracy, uh, and he writes that in um, his Spectres of Marx, the effectivity or actuality of the democratic promise like that of the communist promise, and I think this is a very interesting conflation that Derrida, Derrida makes here as a move, <coughs> will always keep within it, and it must do so, this absolutely undetermined messianic hope at its heart, this eschatological relation to the to come of an event and of a singularity, of an alterity that cannot be anticipated. Let me just note here that when Derrida talks about this messianic hope, uh, he does not mean at all this uh, you know, monotheistic religious uh, messianism, but rather a utopian horizon of performative eventness. I think this is uh, the, the greatest challenge that we're facing today, to, res to resume and reclaim our utopian horizon. Uh, like Marx and Engels, who began their 1848 Communist Manifesto by invoking a specter haunting Europe, which they called communism, Derrida started off his book by invoking ghosts in the plural. The specter that has been haunting the world since 1848 is mobilized today, is remobilized today, in various protests of recent years. Uh, to challenge the present dissolution of democracy into a synonym of prosperous bourgeois West, free market economy, 
liberal globalization and management of debt through unending austerity programs. As it is performed by various political struggles and protests today, this is not democracy. So you see another affirmative negative formulation here. Uh, so you see my trajectory is from the government to the movements because I think this is, if there is any hope here, is exactly to uh, reclaim uh, Syriza, it's Syriza itself uh, uh, sources of origin. Syriza, as you know, is a platform of different movements, uh, social movements, from anti-austerity movements to feminist movements and anti-racist movements. <coughs> so, and since we're talking about, I'm talking about uh, Derrida's the specters of Marx here, let me point to an interesting uh, visual trace from a movement, uh, from a book block, um, uh, which was a mode of street action in which protesters marched uh, wearing books and shields in the streets of different uh, cities in 2010, 11, 12, in defense of public universities and libraries. And uh, what you see here is a policeman uh, who raises his baton against the protest protester who carries a book sign of Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx. And it's interesting how in chasing the unarmed Spectres of Marx, um, uh, the policeman uh, unwittingly re-embodies the, the written explication that the spectral is indeed uh, the disturbingly undead. Uh, so the specters of Marx are undead, and uh, this is a scene that reminds us that those specters still haunt capitalism and its epistemic violence. Uh, the book blocks, but also other strategies of protest, which involve assembling, occupying, standing, marching, bespeak the elements of public collective standing and dissent, as I uh, said before, uh, and we have interesting uh, examples. This is from the Gezi Park revolt, uh, the occupation in, in Istanbul in 2013. Um, so civic revolt uh, and resuming the power of the movements of grassroots uh, civic uh, Stasis, disagreement, uh, revolt. Um, <coughs> okay, let me try to uh, conclude here. Um, well, this is the disagreement that I talked about. Um, so, uh, neoliberal governmentality is about uh, rendering economy an authoritative rationality and subjecting all modes of the political to this domination. And the role of the state is to safeguard the pervasive functions of the market through what Jacques Rancière has called post-democracy, signaling the government practice and conceptual legitimization of a democracy after the demos, as he puts it. A democracy that has eliminated the appearance, miscount, and dispute of the people. In this regard, we have yet to make way for reclaiming the demos of democracy against all this neoliberal dissolution of democracy. And we have to reclaim the demos as plural, groundless, provisional, and open-ended performative event of inhabiting the polis. And I think that we need the political notion of the people not only as a radical response to the, to the neoliberal dissolution of democracy, but also at the same time, we need the notion of the people that radically differs from racist and neo-fascist configurations of the people as closed, solid, homogeneous, racially or ethnically pure. Which brings me to my final point here, which has to do with how to figure a break with the logics and the logistics of the present order of things, which goes back a little bit to the point that Margarita made before <coughs> about decolonizing. Uh, in this sense, um, I would um, suggest that we all go back to a very interesting conversation between Judith Butler and Michel Foucault about the notion of critique. Uh, the, uh, Foucault has written an interesting um, uh, essay, which is called What is Critique? And Butler uh, responds to that. Um, and the interesting thing that I would like to uh, point to here is that uh, Foucault writes that critique is a kind of uh, art of uh, 
voluntary insubordination. And then he talks about uh, desubjugation of the subject in the context of what we call in the world knowledge of truth, so on and so forth. And then Butler too talks about this um, uh, force of desubjugation, the practice by which um, a subject forms itself in desubjugation, which requires, of course, that we break the habits of judgment in favor of a risky practice uh, that seeks to give artistry from constraint. Uh, to conclude then, the only thing that I'd like to point here to, uh, as, a, as an antidote to this uh, sense of powerlessness that I mentioned before, although I try to say that powerlessness is not a matter, is not a moment of political inertia, but it is a moment, it is the quintessential moment of reclaiming the power, the power of the demos, the power of the movements, the power of the people. Um, I'm sure that we all remember this uh, interesting rallying cry, uh, which was don't mourn, organize. Um, it was actually this phrase, don't mourn, organize, was the last words uh, spoken by the immigrant worker, labor movement activist and songwriter Joe Hill in Utah in 1918. And of course this slogan had a second life in the 80s. Uh, in seeking to, uh, to defend the political implications of a counter-public memory in the context of AIDS uh, crisis in the 80s, queer activists stressed the importance of both mourning and militancy. So we are mourning here, but at the same time, we have to resume this critical utopianism that I mentioned before. The critical, the current situation in Europe adds, I think, an achingly uh, new re resonance to this old slogan, rendering, a, rendering it, transforming it, it in uh, a performative call to a democracy to come. Uh, and I think that, after all, this is not uh, only about Greece, this is not about Greece, finally. So thank you very much.